guys who rode the bus 24 hours for for five and stayed at the five bucks a night hostel yeah, yeah that sounded really fun <laughs> man. you yeah. rode the bus 24 hours to get there right <laughs> yeah yeah every night you would go out yeah you know, with other students yeah it sounds like really fun man it must have been a great a great uh, occasion for you i don't know maybe you have such stuff every year but it seems like a really lovely lovely uh yeah even opportunity Pablo for students myself, to meet each other Pablo and myself were in a in a five in a five dollars motel with a guy i know you should have put us there too man <laughs> not in that fancy place you should have put us in the cheap place it's more fun <laughs> in a dormitory, right? With some snoring people, then you have to put the earplugs in, you know? Yeah. <laughs> in those days, nobody had a smartphone. Now I can't even sleep without an audio book. You know, every night I listen to an audio book. I wake up like three times a night. I'm sleeping so bad in this pandemic. But yeah. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I got the, uh, we are on uh, live on YouTube right now. And, uh, so we are ready to go. So I think it uh, will be way better if you introduce uh, Toby, uh, Pedro. Okay. Yeah, I didn't volunteer at the, at the beginning because at this time I have to pick up kids from school. So it's, and they're changing all the time. So it's, uh, I'm not reliable, but since I'm here and Toby is always been great to, to us since he came into Cordoba in 2007. Let me do the honor. So, Toby, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Toby Delbrook, who received a PhD degree from Caltech in 93, uh, in the inaugural class of the Computation and Neural System Program, founded by John Hopfield, as a student of Christoph Koch, David Van Essen, and Carver, Carver Mead. Currently, he's a professor of physics and electrical engineering and at ETH Zurich, in the Institute of Neuroinformatics, University of Zurich and ETH Zurich in Switzerland, where he has been since 1998. He co-organized the Telluride Neuromorphic Cognition Engineering Workshop and the live demonstration sessions at ISCAS and NIPS. Toby is past chair of the IEEE Sensory Systems Technical Committee. He worked on electronic imaging at Aritmos Synaptics uh, National Semiconductor and Fovion as has founded three spin-off companies, included, including Inilabs, which supports basic R&D on neuromorphic sensory processing. He has been awarded nine IEEE awards and was named a fellow of the IEEE Circuits and System for Society for his work on neuromorphic sensors and processes. Besides playing with neuromorphic sensors, he likes to read, play tennis and basketball, and practice car magic on unwary subjects. So having said that, it's a pleasure for me to give it to Toby. Yeah, welcome. Hello, everybody. And I still have very good memories of uh, EAMTA in 2007, coming there with um, Andreas Andreo and enjoying the barbecue. And it was held in Cordoba very cheap uh, housing and at the university. We all ate together. Some people played fo football. We enjoyed the sights. And I came with Andreas Andreo, who is organizing the, the summer school with you this year, right? Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, we had lots of good food. We enjoyed the sights. And the students had a lot of fun talking about circuits, measuring stuff uh, in the laboratory, doing circuit design, doing things. I'm going to show you actually one thing today that I built at this workshop in 2000, at the summer school in 2007, this robot here. Uh, but I have very good memories of the whole uh, experience. So um, I wish I could be there again. Just never had time to come again. So I'm actually coming from the University of Zurich in ETH Zurich, located here in Switzerland, uh, right here in Zurich, um, at the tip of the lake. And our lab is located uh, right here on the Irho campus of the University of Zurich. It's not very far from the airport, maybe about 20 minutes from the airport by tram. If anybody finds themselves in Europe um, and passing through Switzerland, we like visitors. So when the lockdown finally ends and there's some opportunity to come and visit, we'd love to have your, your visit. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the, some work that we've been doing over the past 20 years. Um, it's kind of taken off. Tell me if you can see this okay. Is it all right? Uh, which is yes. about activity. Yeah. There you go. Acti it's fine. Yeah, thank you. It's about activity driven um, artificial intelligence, which is inspired by silicon retinas. And I'm mostly actually going to talk mostly about the design of silicon retina event cameras, which mimic somehow what's happening in the back of the eye in the flow of information yeah. from the photo. The flow of information from the photoreceptors through the bipolar cells into the ganglion cell output. And I guess most people are probably aware that the output from the eye to the brain is occurring on a set of optic nerve fibers that emit spike events, digital spike events that you know, you're seeing me by. Um, this work on these kind of event-based cameras or event cameras has led over the last few years to a lot of work that we've done on moving from uh, deep neural networks that update all the units all the time to a data-driven or activity-driven kind of neural network hardware that only updates the units that need to be updated. And that's one of the key principles by which um, artificial intelligence can be, uh, uh, the efficiency of artificial intelligence and in physical implementation can be improved. And it's a main theme of many of the efforts going on in Silicon Valley. So um, I encourage you to pass on your questions or ask your questions via the chat during the uh, presentation. And I'll try to answer them because I may not be completely clear. So don't hesitate to ask questions and please um, pass those questions on to me if I don't notice them. Okay, so what's it all about? So this talk really has two parts. The first part is about dynamic vision sensor silicon retinas and how we can do things with them like build robots. And then the second part is about how this DVS or dynamic vision sensor led us to data-driven or activity-driven hardware artificial intelligence. Um, let me just start out here. So these are conventional cameras, which we call static vision sensors. They output a stroboscopic sequence of frames. You know that this, this is the first movie ever made. It's only 40 frames long. It was shot 150 years ago by Moybridge in 1878. And since then, the last 150 years have been dominated by this sequence of movie frames as the foundation of computer vision. By the way, I don't know how many people know about the story of Moybridge, but um, look him up on Wikipedia. He was involved in this crime of the century because he murdered his wife's lover, um, which walked up to him and shot him in the head and murdered him in cold blood. And it was the founder of Stanford University who paid for the legal services to get him off on a charge, um, on that murder charge with an insanity plea. So look it up. So this is the Moybridge, the murderer who shot this first movie. Anyhow, these frames are the foundation of vision and they're good, right? They're really good. This idea was a good idea. That's why it's still around 150 years. Um, it's compatible with more than 50 years of machine vision. It allows you to make really small pixels. Nowadays, less than one micron for consumer uh, rolling shutter cameras that you have in smartphones or three to five microns for machine vision sensors that, that uh, expose the picture synchronously. But what's bad about it? What's bad about it is that this output is very redundant. If you look in this video again, you'll see um, that the, uh, the frames are, the pixels are saying the same thing over and over again. So the output is just redundant. And you have to shoot at a sufficient frame rate to, ca frame rate to capture the highest frequencies in the, in the scene. If you don't, then you alias. And you also have limited dynamic range because of the fixed exposure time of the pixels. So, but fundamentally, there's a latency versus power trade-off when you do frame-based vision. You can achieve arbitrarily low latency by burning, arbitrary, by burning lots of power, right? You get a high frame rate sensor, you build a big computer, and you can go at high frame, frame rate and achieve short latency. The problem is it always bur burns a lot of power. Or you can burn very low power by just going at very low frame rate, but then you can only respond with much lower, longer latency. This is kind of a trade-off, but does biology have that problem? Um, well, it does not because you, if you look at the human eye as a digital camera, um, as I said before, it consists of these layers. On the outside, you have the photoreceptor, then the bipolar cells and the horizontal cells. There are also lateral networks of neurons, which I won't talk about. And if you look at this as a digital camera, it outputs digital data to the brain. 
It has 100 million photoreceptors. It has a million output fibers carrying a maximum 100 hertz spike rates. Um, it has a huge dynamic range, over 180 dB from starlight to bright sunlight. Uh, within the networks of neurons in, in the eye, there are at least 20 different computations going on, different views of the world that are being computed by our eyes and being sent to the brain for various purposes. So it's a sophisticated neural network all by itself. It does many teraops per second of computing. And how much power do you think it burns? Well, a smartphone camera burns, you know, several hundred milliwatts when it's active. Your eye burns about three milliwatts of power total. Um, what is the output? The output is a sparse asynchronous stream of digital spike events on these million optic nerve fibers. So can we build a camera that works like that? Uh, the answer after about 30 years of, of work is yes, you can. And it, it's a dynamic vision sensor pixel. It mimics the flow of information from photoreceptor bipolar cell, ganglion cell. And it starts with the, uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the circuit because I intend to teach a little bit about the CMOS circuits. It starts with a photodiode that continuously turns a current into a logarithmic voltage using a logarithmic trans impedance amplifier. And then it capacitively couples that to a change detector, which mimics these bipolar cells. Um, they're called bipolar because they have two tufts on them. Um, but anyhow, this change amplifier, every time the pixel sends out an event, we close the switch here, we set this voltage to a fixed voltage, and then we open the switch. And now any change in the voltage here is reflected in a change in the voltage here. But we've removed the DC mismatch from this output. Now we put an amplifier with a gain of about 20, and we take the output of this amplifier, which is going away from some reset level, and we send that into two comparators. These are continuous time comparators, just high gain amplifiers, which have a threshold set a bit above the reset level and a bit below the reset level. Whenever the comparator output crosses its threshold, it means that there was a brightness change event, either on or off. And so uh, the stream of events that come from the pixel it represent delta log intensity changes, basically just brightness change events. And every time the pixel sends an event out as its address, uh, the pixel is reset back to the starting point. So it's very simple, just a complete abstraction of the real complex biological retina, but it turns out that this is a really useful representation uh, for lots of vision problems. So I'm gonna do a demonstration now. Uh, that shows that the dynamic vision sensor silicon retinas deliver the data as a sparse asynchronous stream of digital brightness change events that mimics the optic nerve output of the eye. Now what I have here, I'm not sure if you can see my video, but I have here a camera. Um, I have various stimuli like a rotating disc and I have a light source just to make it a bit brighter, which is a ring light for a microscope. And I'm now going to show the camera output. Um, let's see, I've got it running here. Yeah, here it is. Can you guys see this okay? Yep. Okay, so when the output is gray like that, uh, there are no spike events because nothing's changing. If I move in front of it, like move my hand, you see it's getting black or white. That means that within the 16 milliseconds or so, there was either on if it's white or off if it's dark spike events. In fact, it's quite cool. I can just take this and aim it out this way. And now I can listen to one of these pixels. Let me put the mouse right here. And now I'm gonna put an electrode into that pixel. We can listen to it. Can you hear it? As my fingers cross the pixel, should hear those spike events going by. Is it clear? If I put yeah. it against a black background and now I've got a white, a little white ruler, right? If I put the camera in front of this black background, which is a closet wall and move it across, you should see on events at the leading edge, right? Because it's a white ruler on a black background. So the leading edge should make white on events and the trailing edge should make black on and off events. So I hope that's clear. So what, are you, what I'm doing here is just painting those events onto this constant frame time. But actually, it's not um, frames that come out of the camera. It's actually just a stream of these spike events as addresses and timestamps. Now, let me show you something else that's quite cool. 
I've got this little rotating black dot here, okay? I'm quite proud of my setup where I've built a little Arduino um, board that has a little battery that powers SpongeBob. So SpongeBob is a little um, fan that has a disc mounted on it. And now I'm going to activate this um, Arduino to turn on the fan. Let me type a character here. I'll type seven, say. Okay, so the fan starts rotating, right? You see it? You hear the spike events? I'm gonna turn those off. It's spinning quite fast, right? Still making spike events. Uh, it's spinning at about 100 hertz now. Um, so that's what would happen if I record it. Now, I just recorded that a few minutes ago. I'll stop the fan going here. I'll just play back the recording. And disk SpongeBob 7. Let's look at that. And now what we see, this is the disk. Let me just fast forward here. This is the disk played in real time. So this is real time like you just saw, but because we've recorded the spike events, we can slow it down to very slow frame time, like 221 microseconds per frame, or even 100 microseconds per frame. You see here, we still get the off events at the leading edge and the on events at the trailing edge. So we can play back the spikes that we've recorded onto a computer at any frame rate we like. In this case, the frame rate is about 10,000 frames per second, 100 microsecond frames. Um, and all we've recorded on the computer is not all the pixels. We've just recorded these brightness change events. That means the data is quite sparse. Even at this 10,000 frames per second, the data rate is about a million events per second. And each event re requires a storage of um, about four bytes of data. So it's about four megabytes a second of data. We can also look at the data in a different way, right? If I look at it in space time and I speed it up here, what you should see, if I pause it, I can look at this data in space time and you can see that the disk here is turning into a helix in space time. So what your job is to process is this sparse stream of these brightness change events if you wanna solve a vision problem. I hope that all helps to help understand what's, um, what's being shown here. Okay. Um, so let me now go back to the slide. If there are any questions, please ask them on the chat. All right. Okay, here's another demonstration. I don't know if you're aware of it, but inside each ear, you have a, what's called a vestibular canal. Um, you have these canals, these physical canals inside a ear that sense the rotation and the acceleration of your head in space. And now with the production of smartphones in the billions every year, um, it's possible to buy these beautiful uh, MEMS accelerometers uh, for very cheap. Here's a six degree of freedom IMU inertial measurement unit that samples at a rate of one kilohertz. It burns less than three milliwatts. It's literally the size of a grain of rice and it costs less than $3. And it has a beautiful little simple I squared C um, interface, right? So what can you do with that? That really allows you to put a kind of vestibular sense onto each camera. And so on the back of the camera chip, right inside the camera case, right on the same PCB that holds the camera chip, we put one of these inertial measurement units that allows us to, go, to combine, to fuse together the information of these spike events with the IMU. And what can we do with that? Well, one thing we can do is stabilize the output electronically. The way you do it when you walk around the world is your vestibular senses are constantly causing your eye to counter rotate to, to stabilize the visual input. If you have an overdose of antibiotics, you can kill the hair cells that are in the vestibular canals. And when you kill those hair cells, you lose your sense of balance. And also you won't be able to see while you're walking around. Your vision will just become too blurry. So I'm gonna demonstrate that for you now with the sensor what that does for you. Um, if I show the output of the sensor again, I look at myself and I'm gonna turn on the IMU now. Do you see this purple arrow at the, at the middle of the sensor? Let me zoom up on that. 
This tells you the rotation of the camera around its own axis in degrees per second. So if I, you see the little vector here? If I rotate it to the left or right, so I pan the image, you can see it's telling me that I'm rotating at about 190 degrees per second, right? Or I can tilt it up and down, or I can rotate it around uh, the lens axis. That tells me. So I have three degrees of rotation of the camera. So that's like the vestibular canals that sense the rotation of the head. Once I have that, how can I use it? Well, one thing you can do is compute a transform continuously. Every time you get an IMU update, you update a uh, rotation and translation vector, and you can use that then to take the event addresses and put them back where they started to some arbitrary starting point. Let me demonstrate that for you. Um, it's with the Steadicam uh, filter. Okay, so I'm gonna take the camera and pretend I'm walking around or running, and this is without Steadicam, and this is with it. This is without it. You see how it's moving around quite wildly? And now I'm gonna turn on the Steadicam. I'm not sure what your sample rate is there. Uh, where is it again? Yeah, and this is stabilized. Do you see how the um, information from the sensor is stabilizing it? Yeah, and that'll and the the fact that you have events allows you to do that on a pixel by pixel on an event by event basis, and you only have to do it to the events. You don't have to do it at every pixel, just to the brightness change events. The cool thing about that is that it exposes the motion parallax in the scene. If I now move my head relative to the bookshelf, there's a bookshelf behind me here. If I move my camera relative, do you see how there's some motion parallax? Because I'm closer to the camera than that bookshelf, my head moves. But now if I turn on the Steadicam, it makes it really clear. It keeps the background steady, but my head is now moving in front of it because I'm moving the camera side to side. This is without it, so it's very confusing, but this is with it. So it makes the foreground stand out in, uh, with respect to the background. And that should be quite useful when you build mobile robots, especially walking robots like uh, quadrupeds that have to navigate or, or off-road vehicles that go over a bouncy ground. All right, so I hope, hope that's helpful to, to understand what the, the sensor can do. Um, nowadays, because Sony and Samsung and big industry parties have gotten interested in building these things, um, here's a 2020 example of a stack pixel. You might be aware that nowadays, many uh, advanced image sensors are built in stacked wafer technology where the top wafer just does the photo detection and has a couple of transistors. And then the bottom wafer has all the digital circuits and, and a lot of the analog circuits. And these pixels are copper bonded uh, wafer to wafer at the single pixel level. That allowed Sony to fabricate a DVS, like I just showed you, um, where the top wafer is a 90 nanometer back illuminated CMOS image sensor technology. And the bottom wafer is a 40 nanometer CMOS digital or mixed signal wafer. It allowed them to make a pixel that's five microns, about five micron pitch with over eight, almost 80% fill factor. And this is reported um, at, um, ISSCC in 2020, it has pixel level copper copper connection. So the top wafer just has the photodiode and a couple of NMOS, and the bottom wafer has the PMOS and all the other circuit, all the other transistors, about 50 transistors that it takes to make one of these DBS pixels. And the amazing thing is they fit this all into five by five micron. <laughs> so it's getting close to a global shutter image sensor like you might have for an automotive uh, camera. All right. Okay, so now I wanna to get to some principles of the CMOS circuits and how they work. So the key thing, and the key thing that held up duromorphic engineering for about 20 years is transistor mismatch. Because of threshold variation in the transistors, the subthreshold current in the transistors varies by a huge amount, um, 20, 30, even a factor of two pixel to pixel. Um, so how does the DBS pixel overcome this inherent transistor mismatch that you get in subthreshold uh, operation. Well, the key is the gain and the DC AC coupling. So, you know, when you build the comparators, which are these amplifiers here, inevitably you're going to get a lot of mismatch in the comparator thresholds. And the cap here blocks the DC 
and you get an amplified change of log intensity at the output of this, of this change amplifier. And that goes into the comparators, which detect the threshold change of log intensity. But the threshold, the transistor threshold DC variation of log intensity is quite big. The cap blocks it, but still you have comparator mismatch. So you have a histogram statistically of the comparator thresholds that's quite big. It's too big to be usable. But the fact that you have this gain here, when you re refer to the mismatch back through the gain, which is a factor of 20 or so, it turns into a much smaller mismatch that's much closer to the origin referred back to the input. So the gain reduces the input referred mismatch to the point that you can build sensors that are actually usable for real world stuff. And I wanna show you now an example of that. If I, if I play back a recording, I'll turn off the IMU. I'll play back a recording here. I'm not sure how this comes out, um, but if I, this is a recording made at our institute, just walking through the lab or actually running through the lab with the sensor. You can see here a couple of people as they pass through the lab. And you can see that it's working fine. You know, if you had to walk through the lab and watch this, this video, you could do it fine. So because of that, if you didn't have this uh, mismatch reduction process, you would just have basically an unusable output. All right, so now let's look at the pixel circuit itself, the transistor level circuit. Um, so the effect of that is to turn a 10 millivolt mismatch here with a gain of 20 into a half millivolt mismatch at input. And so that, that corresponds to about a plus or minus 2% change in the, uh, in the intensity. And so that allows you to set the threshold at about 20% and you know, not have pixels fire all the time because a mismatch makes the threshold extremely low. Okay, um, that's saying the same thing. So now what is the actual CMOS circuit of the pixel? So it has a front end, which is a photodiode, and here's a logarithmic transimpedance amplifier. Right? The photo current here makes a current. Then this, uh, uh, the source of this feedback transistor is connected to the input of an inverting amplifier formed of MN and this current source, which is just a PFAT. So this is an inverting amplifier here, single uh, common source inverting amplifier. There's a cascode in it. So what happens is if the photo current increases, this source voltage gets pulled down a little bit, that causes the output of the amplifier to go up a lot more, say a factor of 100 more, that ends up pulling up the gate of this feedback transistor. So that's the transimpedance amplifier. So what it does is it holds the photodiode clamped at a virtual ground and effectively increases the source conductance looking into the source of MFB by a factor of about 100. That's why the DBS pixel is so fast because of the, it reduces the parasitic capacitance, um, the, G, the, the, the C over GM time constant here uh, by the loop gain of this amplifier. And then there's a source follower buffer that buffers the output with unity gain on to the change detector. So a key part of this DBS pixel is this seven transistor two capacitor change detector, which is right here. I think it's a really beautiful circuit. It's a switch capacitor circuit, but it operates asynchronously driven by the change detection events. Um, it has two capacitors, C1 and C2. And when you reset the pixel, you basically diode connect this PFET here, right? You short this transistor, this is the reset switch. So when, you, when this transistor is turned on here, what you're doing is just diode connecting this PFET. At that point, this um, gate voltage uh, adjusts itself so that it syncs the bias current ID, right? So at this point, this gate voltage is just sourcing ID from this top transistor. Now, when you open the switch, this top transistor still sources ID, right? The output voltage doesn't change. Uh, it's just sitting there. But now the feedback is through, from the output of the amplifier through C2 uh, back to the input. And this is a capacitor divider, C1 and C2. If you work it out, you'll see the gain of this circuit is C1 over C2. We make this ratio about 20 to one. So C1 is much bigger than C2. That makes a gain of about minus 20. So if you get a one millivolt increase here, this goes down by 20 millivolts. Now, what about the comparators? You see they're just single stage uh, amplifiers, right? So at the balance point, we adjust uh, this, remember this thing is diode connected, right? At that point, the same gate voltage, which is the output, remember it's shorted together, is connected to these in two PFET gates. 
we adjust I on so that it's bigger than ID and I off so it's smaller than ID. At that point in reset, since I on is bigger, this output voltage on is low and the, this voltage off is high, right? Because the currents are bigger than ID and less than ID. Now, when we open the reset switch and there's a change in the voltage, this voltage goes up or down. If it goes down enough because there's an increase of intensity, this current here becomes bigger than I on, and then the voltage here goes up, and that's an on event. And same, same for the off event. It's really quite a cool circuit because you can build all this stuff here with just seven transistors and two capacitors. Um, and only six of those transistors have to be big transistors to reduce the mismatch. Okay. It wasn't until about three years ago that we realized that this circuit also gives you temperature independence. If you think about it for a little bit, because all these circuits are working in some threshold, um, together with the log photoreceptor provides temperature independent temporal contrast threshold. I'm going to try to explain this now, and perhaps you can watch it in the video if, if you don't get it the first time. So look at the circuit again here. It turns out if these subthreshold bias currents have constant ratio to each other, in other words, if I on over ID is uh, fixed, and if I off over ID is fixed, then, and we know that this output voltage VP is proportional to the absolute temperature through the thermal voltage, right? So this VP voltage right here is somehow PTAT, proportional to absolute temperature. If that's true, then it turns out, and it, it's also true that the threshold voltage here that you get at the input of this change detector is inversely proportional to the uh, absolute temperature through the thermal voltage. That's because of the subthreshold operation of these circuits. So this thing is proportional to absolute temperature, and this one's inversely proportional to absolute temperature through the thermal voltage. That means overall, when you put these two things together, the threshold for log intensity change is only proportional to the natural log ratio of I on over ID. It's, there's no temperature dependence. It's just an accident that it worked out that way, but that's very nice because it means that when you build one of these chips and look at the output of the events, you see that it's largely invariant with temperature over about 80 degrees centigrade operating range. And that's important when you want to use a sensor like this in automotive applications or or IoT applications where you can't control the environmental temperature. I hope that helps to explain a bit about the circuit. Um, that's all I want to say about the circuit. Um, I just want to now show you some application of the sensor. So this is a robot that we built uh, at the 2007 um, uh, summer school. I'm going to show you a few pictures of that summer school. I don't think I did yet. Um, so these are photos actually. Yeah, I think I did show you the pictures. So um, let's go back to this. So do you know this game? I'm not sure if it's played in South America, but in, in America, it's in North America, at least in the US, it's a popular bar game. You hold, a, you hold some money up, you're at the bar and you wanna see who's gonna pay for the drinks. And you ask your friend here, man, if you can catch this bill, you can have it. And you ask them, see, can you catch that? If you're there with a friend, I recommend you try it. Ask your friend. I can ask Shichi if she can come in from the other room uh, to see whether she can actually catch that bill. I can do it myself, right? I'm very fast. But try it with your friend. You'll, you'll find out that it's impossible for them to catch it. If you do it cleverly, it's impossible for them to catch it because the human reaction time is just too slow. So how could you do it now if you have a camera like this DVS and you wanted to catch this? Well, one thing, because the events are so quick here, if you can measure the flow, the optic flow, I won't explain how you do that, but if you can measure the optic flow and you see that the optic flow is suddenly starting to increase going downwards, then you can close the fingers to catch it. And so at the summer school in 2007, I took two glue sticks uh, from a hot glue gun and a servo motor, and I built this little robot just in software, the bill catcher. And perhaps you can watch it here. <laughs> it sees that the, the, the money is falling and just closes those glue stick fingers to catch it. Try it with your friends and see if you enjoy that game. Um, you can do other things with this. Uh, so the way it works is you measure the optic flow 
there's various ways to do that. And when it's bigger than some threshold, which you just adjust with a GUI, uh, then you activate the servo motor to close the, the fingers. Okay. Um, nowadays, the computer vision people are doing a lot of work with these sensors. And they basically answered the question of how much information is in this stream of events. Um, and so here is a little snapshot of a segment of events that were recorded during the PhD exam of Henri Rebeck, who was in Davide Scaramuzza's lab at the Robotics and Perception Group at the University of Zurich. Um, it's amazing that he developed a deep network that produced from this stream of events, this image right here. So this is not an image taken with a normal camera. This is just a reconstruction of the frame input sequence that would have resulted in this set of events here. That's me right there. Um, that's Andy Davison, Davide Scaramuzza, and that's Henri Rebeck here who did this work. How does he do that? Well, what he did was, I don't know how much you guys know about deep learning, uh, but he trained a network, a neural network to do this stuff. So the neural network takes a sequence of DBS frames as input, um, you know, four or six of them. Each frame represents a few milliseconds of activity, uh, just like I showed you in the demonstration. And then that's sent into a pretty big convolutional U-net. It's a convolutional network um, with these kind of connections between it. And a key property of this is it has memory units called conf LSTM layers. These are convolutional long short-term memory layers. This allows the network to maintain memory over samples, kind of like cortex does when it has persistent activity of the spiking neurons. And the output of this network is the video frame. The network is trained on sample images that are just transformed uh, rotated and scaled and so on. And then simulated DVS events are generated from these transformed images and fed in as input. And then the output should be the original Coco image that's been shown to it. This thing runs in real time, but it, it's only on a powerful um, thousand dollar GPU. And what they showed was this beautiful uh, work. Um, I have to show it properly here. Uh, they showed that this network was able to uh, reconstruct video uh, like this here, um, uh, where they could make a 5,000 frame per second video just from the DVS events uh, of the, this Swiss statue being blown up by um, a Swiss army rifle. And so they're able to make very high speed video here by reconstructing from the DBS events that are recorded from one of our cameras, uh, the slow motion video. All right. Uh, let's skip this here. So anyway, I wanna to get towards the end here. Um, the main thing that this led us to over the last five years was a way of thinking about doing hardware artificial intelligence that's more driven by activity um, than the typical GPUs that, or tensor processing units that, that are now being used in industry. So normally when you update a neural network, you update all the neurons regardless of the data and you update them on every frame. It's not like the network has a memory, um, but that's not how your brain works, right? Your brain is very different than that. Um, it's much more activity driven. And so now just to introduce you to a bit of neuromorphic engineering, I wanna talk about sparse computing in the brain. So I'm gonna do some numerology, a bit like Enrico Fermi did when he computed the force of uh, the first atomic bomb blast. You just take some numbers and try to infer another number from them. Um, so let's estimate the energy use and spike rate in the human brain. Your brain has about 10 to the 11 neurons and each neuron has a fan out of about how many? The, the fan out of neurons in the brain, in the cortex, is about 10 to the four. So we have that many neurons and each neuron has that fan out. Now what we're gonna do is compute the energy per synaptic activation. When a neuron spikes, how much energy does one synaptic activation, one connection from a neuron to another, how much energy does that take? You can compute that if you know the power supply of the brain, which is 100 millivolts, and you know how much current is, is consumed when a, when a synapse is turned on. It's about a nanoamp. And if you know how long the synapse is turned on, 
It's about a millisecond. So if you multiply these three numbers, you can get the number for energy per synaptic activation. It's about 10 to the minus 13 joules. So if you now take the number of neurons in the brain, multiply by the number of synapses per neuron, multiply by the joules per synaptic activation, and multiply that by the, by the average spike rate in the brain, you should get the brain's power consumption. And the human brain burns about 10 watts. <laughs> you know, it's pretty amazing. So, but what we're interested in is how fast are the neurons spiking on the average? If you multiply all these numbers together and work out what X is, it turns out that it's only about one Hertz. So on the average in your brain, your neurons are only spiking about once a second. Of course, it's much faster at the sensory periphery, like on the cochlea or the retina or your skin cells when you're rubbing your hand. The spike rate is much higher. In the middle of your brain, in your frontal cortex, the spot, neurons might spike only once every few minutes. But still, the really interesting thing is the average spike rate is very low. But even though the average spike rate is very low, the average input rate to the neurons is still very high. Because remember, there's a big fan in and fan out. Because of this high fan in of 10 to the 4, it means that the average synaptic input rate per neuron is still 10 kilohertz. So the neurons in your cortex are still getting tickled 10,000 times a second by incoming spikes. Only once a second or so do they actually make a spike. So that's very different than conventional deep neural networks where every neuron sends its messages to all recipients at the fixed sample rate. Um, and I strongly believe that exploiting sparsity and connections and activations is the key direction of current hardware AI developments. And, um, you know, the GPUs that people use nowadays for running neural networks and even the tensor processing units that are developed by Google and Intel, Movidius, they don't exploit the sparsity at all. They just do all the computations regardless of the data. So that means they waste a lot of energy. So everything we're doing and a lot of industry is doing now is to try to go away from this idea of being frame driven to, to being activity driven or data driven. So the key principle is to let the data drive the computation. Don't let a clock drive it, let the information drive the computation. And so just one example of something that we did in that direction is to exploit spatial sparsity in convolutional neural networks. And we did that with a null hop CNN accelerator. The null hop refers to the fact that it skips the zeros. A very popular activation function in many neural networks now is the ReLU, it's the rectified linear unit. If the input is less than zero, then the output is just zero. But if a neural output is zero, then it can't have any downstream influence, right? Because no matter what weight you multiply it by, the output will, the effect will be zero. So that means if you know that a neuron is not activated, it's like it's not spiking. So you don't have to bother to update its downstream targets. And it turns out if you train a neural network like this VGG16 on ImageNet and ask what is the sparsity as a function of the layer number. So this is the input layers here. And finally, you have the fully connected layers at the output that recognize what kind of picture it is. And this is the sparsity percentage as a function. Uh, uh, it means the number of zero units on the typical image. If you train the network at 32-bit floating point precision, then you only get a sparsity around 50%, you know, about half the neurons are active. But it turns out if you train it at fixed point precision, so all the weights that are very small are rounded to zero, and all the activations go to zero that are small, then the sparsity rises up to about 80%. So only 20% of the neurons on the average are actually active. So you don't need to bother to update the downstream targets of those neurons, and your hardware should exploit that fact. And that's what NullHop does. It uses an architecture like this, I won't bother to show you, uh, but the key, key thing is that it stores the feature maps and um, the kernels for the convolutions in external DRAM memory in a compressed form so that it uses a sparsity map to store the features maps with about 1.x bits per pixel for zero pixels. In other words, when the pixel is zero, it only takes about a bit of memory to store it instead of 16 bits. And that saves you lots of external DRAM memory access. And plus, you skip all the activation computations for those pixels. It completely skips the multiply accumulates for zero pixels. And as a result, you get a CNN accelerator with about four times superior memory use. It uses four times less memory for the activations. It gets four times higher throughput, four times shorter latency, and four times better energy efficiency than if you didn't do this.
And so at the time of publication, um, this accelerator um, in 28 nanometer technology would achieve 500 gigaos per second throughput and about three teraos per second per watt core power efficiency. That's about 300 times, um, let's see, that's about, yeah, that's about 300 times more better energy efficiency than a typical GPU, which only gets about 10 gigaos uh, per second, per, per uh, second per watt power efficiency. So that's just one example of, of something that's going on in hardware AIs. I think it's a really interesting area in digital um, chip development. And perhaps some of you are working on it already for a huge range of applications. So in summary, what I showed you was how um, we could build a silicon retina, how that leads us towards um, a data-driven kind of computing style for, for hardware AI. And um, a key direction in this area is to exploit the fact that the dominant memory technology is DRAM. And DRAM has a preferred reading direction. It likes to read along the row direction, not the column direction. So if you're going to build big neural networks, you need DRAM. SRAM is too expensive. And so whatever accelerator you build has to work together with the fact that it is a, it's going to be DRAM based, the memory. So you have to take advantage of sparsity, but also be aware that your memory is best read in burst mode from DRAM memory. Okay, with that, I put up this slide of some additional material. And on behalf of the census group, which is led by myself and Chi Chi Lu here, um, I hope some of you can come visit us someday. Thank you for your attention. Oh, by the way, one more thing. I'm going to put um, onto the chat of the Zoom here a link to these slides. Um, let me see the chat here. So you can download them. And then as you like at your leisure, you might enjoy looking at some other robots that we built, like the goalie robot, the Trixie, the card finding magic robot. It's running. And the Dextra Rochambeau robot that beats people at the game of rock, scissors, paper. Guaranteed. So enjoy. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> That was a bit fast, uh, but anyway, I'm happy to take any questions about this, the circuit design techniques or anything you like. Okay, guys, <clears throat> questions? Did you guys get the chat? Did you see on the chat the link to this Dropbox slides? Yeah. It's a big file, about 700 megabytes, because it has all the video embedded. By the way, you can get all these videos on YouTube too. And there's a much longer talk that I gave that goes much more into the circuit techniques. It's also on YouTube. It's a lot about the CMOS circuit design techniques that are used in a sensor like this. How far, Toby, have you, have you tried with the, with the temperature and, and confirmed that it, it doesn't change? Yeah, so what I didn't tell you was that what happens when at higher temperature, it's a really good question. So he's asking, uh, Pedro's asking, um, how far did we push this temperature stuff? Um, this is still a problem. Um, industrial temperature range is like up to 120 degrees centigrade, right? That's what happens inside a hot car in Las Vegas uh, in the summertime, right? You know, you have to really work at extremely high temperature. What happens at very high temperature is the junction leakage increases a lot. And so if you actually look at the pixel design, um, I'll go back to it here. I don't know if anybody else has experienced this problem of of uh, high temperature in pixels. But if I go back, for example, to the pixel um, circuit, let's look at the detailed schematic. You see there's a switch right here, right? This is a P PMOS switch. And ideally it should not leak at all, but it turns out that there's a junction from this PFET up to the end well that holds it, right? There is a, a parasitic mm -hmm. junction there. At high temperature, this junction starts to leak substantially. That means that charge is flowing onto this node from VDD. When you pour charge onto this floating node here from VDD, it's as though the temperature was increasing. Is it clear? Yeah. You're changing the amount of charge on that node. And so that's why when you look at the temperature curve at very high temperature, 
the amount, the threshold for off events goes up and the threshold for on events goes down. And it actually, what happens is at high temperature, you start getting more and more of these so-called leak events. You know, you get a background of these mm -hmm. on events, um, which you can actually see here. If I, if I uh, show you the sensor output, um, let me just replug the sensor here. Um, I'll turn off a, a little denoising filter. And now if I just let the events integrate over time, do you see those on events that are accumulating? Yeah. Those are those so-called leak events. If you increase the temperature a lot, like up to 80 degrees, you'll get more and more of those leak events. They're very easy to denoise to get rid of because they're not correlated. In fact, if I turn on this very simple denoising filter and again, integrate the events, you get practically zero. But when the temperature gets really high, um, you know, you do get lots of them. And so that increases the data rate at high temperature. Hope that helps answer the question. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so are you guys still doing the barbecues there or everything's online now? No, everything this year, everything is online. Ah, yeah. bummer. <laughs> yeah. Bummer, football, no barbecue. But last year we did both. We did soccer and we did asado. Yeah. Well, I really <laughs> hope I can come again someday. <laughs> Yeah, maybe when this COVID leaves us for good. Okay, okay. more questions. Um, I, I was wondering if you've played around with color DVS uh, sensors and signals, so using color filters and then uh, RGB. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So do we have a color version of this sensor? Yeah, we do. There, we Because we did this fabrication through Tower Jazz technology as part of a European project, we were able to fabricate some of the wafers. We actually had a dedicated wafer around. We were able to fabricate some of the wafers with color filter array over them. And that means that the individual pixels have either a red, green, or blue filter over them. And we haven't used them much, but people um, have produced now, uh, one of the groups has produced a color event data set. You can play around with these color, color output streams and they've shown that uh, it's possible to reconstruct high dynamic range color video from them. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, you know, I haven't used that sensor in my, even though we built that sensor, I haven't hardly played with the color. It's a bit hard to make sense out of it. What does a color brightness change event mean, right? It's hard to interpret, but machine learning can learn to interpret it. So it can do reconstruction. By the way, reconstruction is not, is not sensible, right? You shouldn't take this DVS camera, run it through a 100 watt GPU and reconstruct frames again, and then use those frames. That doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is to directly train a network that just exploits the events and and uh, reconstructs latent representations that are useful for a particular problem. But just for the purpose of demonstration, it's quite cool that you can see that it's possible to reconstruct high dynamic range video. And it does allow you to run some uh, conventional algorithm on the output. But the most recent results that are impressive are, you know, you just skip that step and you just directly solve the problem of visual odometry or object detection. And if you use one of these sensors as an input for uh, restoring sight to the blind people, it's a nice sensor for that because it produces an output that's very much like the eye. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't make a frame, right? And then send that to the brain, right? You would produce some input to the, to the visual cortex um, that directly simulates phosphine that people can, can understand. So, you know, you would pick out, you know, like here is floor, right? The person might, who has a, a prosthetic might uh, set it, say, show me where it's safe to walk. And then it'll stimulate phosphines where it's safe for them to walk without obstacles. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? You don't need lots of pixels then, but you need high dynamic range to deal with bad lighting. And you need a sparse output so it can run on battery power for a whole day, you know? So you can, you can run it for the whole day and then plug it in at night while you're sleeping. Thanks. Uh, anyone, anyone following on YouTube on the YouTube channel? The, there are any questions over there? Okay. No, uh, there's no question on YouTube. We have a question in the chat, uh, Toby. If you can see, this is possible to build a three D model from a reconstruction of movement or the use of multiple cameras? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question relates to stereo vision and motion estimation, I believe, or, or a 3D reconstruction of the world from camera motion. 
Yeah, I haven't done much of that work myself, but people have shown now they can use deep learning techniques to do quite accurate monocular depth estimation. It's called monocular depth estimation. You just estimate the depth of the scene from the movement of a single camera. People have also done some work recently. You should look in the CVPR, uh, computer vision and pattern recognition workshops for papers about that using deep learning techniques. Handcrafted approaches don't work very well uh, because it's really difficult to come up with the proper functions by hand. But now deep learning has been quite successful. The networks are big, you know, they're not very efficient right now, but they seem to get decent results. I hope that helps. It's a nice sensor, right? It produces sparse output, which eventually will exploit sparse hardware AI that don't exist yet, but for sure it's gonna exist. And the sensor produces precise timing, has high dynamic range. So in some ways it's quite a nice sensor, um, you know, because you, you, you have quite a, a lot of advantages. The problem is nobody's gone into mass production with these things yet. There's no mass production customer and so the cameras are, are, our research prototypes are quite expensive, like thousands of dollars each for groups to play with. Um, you know, so it's not like the connect time of flight sensor or even a bolometer, right? You still have to pay a lot of money to, to do experiments. But hopefully, you know, somebody will become a mass production customer in the next year or so, and then the price will drop like a rock. I think one of the main potential application areas is automotive. I'll uh, just say uh, the reason automotive is so attractive. I mean, there's true that there are really good high resolution automotive cameras right now. The problem with them is that they still burn a lot of power to process the output. And they still have problems with flickering lighting sources. You know, now that car headlights and tail lights, brake lights and so on and traffic signs are all becoming LED lighting. Most of those uh, lighting sources are pulse width modulated. And because they're pulse width modulated at high frequency, when you use a global shutter sensor to take the picture, in one frame it might be on, in the next frame it might be off. And so what happens is the tail lights go on and off in between frames, or the stop light goes on and off between yeah. frames. It's still a problem that's not solved. There are techniques to deal with it, but every one of those techniques is expensive. But if you use a DVS, what do you see? You just see a stream of these brightness change events that tells you there's a traffic light or there's a brake light. It really makes them pop out. It tells you that there's a flickering LED lighting source there. So, you know, there are some potential advantages that are quite cool. Uh, but again, the problem is economics, right? It's the megapixel race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to introduce a new technology. Okay, we have another Good. question there. These sensor with appropriate filters could be used to detect temperature changes. No, I wouldn't use it. No, is it a thermal camera? Is it a heat camera? No, the, the photo, that's a good question. Um, it's possible to build a heat camera. In fact, I believe there's an ongoing DARPA project uh, exactly, um, it's kind of a top secret DARPA project basically to build like a missile a missile detector, right? You know, you see the, the, the exhaust plume of missiles or rockets, stuff like that. Um, also, you can track uh, vehicles in the water and, you know, do, but but to do that you need a hybrid technology you need a you need a top wafer which is not silicon it needs to be some small band gap material that can detect the longer wavelength heat photons and then you have to burn a lot of money on fabrication but the principle is the same right you would, instead of outputting the heat pictures you would detect these heat change events does that help yep any other question, guys? So check out the DARPA project if you're interested. And I think there's a DARPA project that just started running. You're not going to get much out of them because it's one of these, one of these things where the big, um, the big R and D, you know, uh, bottom feeders are involved. They don't, they don't say anything. Are you guys shy or? Um, I would have a question. Um, so if you look at a high spatial frequency scene with a shaking camera or a relative motion of the camera, I suppose the scene that you would create a significant number of events. So you, the, the sparsity yeah. is reduced in that sense. So for an automotive Definitely. application, um, is that a problem? Or are you in a regime where um, you still have a significant benefit from this kind of uh, event-driven yeah. um, situation? 
You're right. That the ideal situation is like surveillance, where most of the time there's nothing going on. And once in a while, there's something that you want to see, you know, move quickly. Yes. But still, even in driving, if you look at a typical 20 millisecond segment of time, um, only 10% of the pixels are active. I've looked at this just recently because we had a, um, I could play the video for you, but just trust me that in, in a typical frame time, only about 10% of the pixels are active. So you still have 90% sparsity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, it's true that the data rate goes up a lot, especially when you're turning or something. When you have dense texture and the camera's panning across the scene, you get a lot of, lot of activity. But nowadays, the industries, industry DBS have much higher output data rate. The camera I just showed you, prototype, gets about 10 million events a second over USB um, high-speed interface. Nowadays, the cameras from Samsung and, and Sony reach hundreds of millions of events per second over their MIPI interfaces. And what they do is they don't just send every event, they just make frames out of them and they send a high frame rate of, of sparse frames. Mm -hmm. So they, they have frames, but the frames are very compressed. And so it's not really a practical problem. And you can also do stuff. And in fact, I'm just working on a paper right now where you do automatic um, threshold control. Mm -hmm. So you know how normal cameras do automatic exposure control to uh, control the exposure time. In fact, this camera has a frame output where we implement a little exposure control algorithm to just set the exposure time correctly. Very sensible to also automatically set the threshold to control the data rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And, you know, it just hasn't been done yet because most people play around with these things on a lab bench, you know, where you don't need, you don't, you're in control of that, right? By hand. But when you really roll it out to a real, you know, IoT or, or mobile robotic application, you have to worry about stuff like that much more. Thank you for the question. By the way, um, I just want to finish right now. I just want to encourage the, all the people that like the summer school and are interested in some way in uh, neuromorphic engineering that they should be aware that there is going to be a Telluride neuromorphic engineering workshop uh, taking place this summer, the 2021 Telluride neuromorphic cognition engineering workshop. It'll be online. It'll be free. People can participate, either just listen to the talks or participate in the topic areas. There's going to be a series of topic areas of different types. I'll put the link here on the chat of the Zoom um, so that everybody can have a look at it, at least be aware of it um, uh, for, uh, you know, in case you are looking for something to get into neuromorphic engineering and meet other people who are interested in this area. I'm one of the organizers of this, of this um, yeah. online workshop. It's a three-week workshop where you really do work. It's a little bit like your, your summer school. So you have well, an actually, opportunity to participate in project work on, on research projects. Actually, Toby Wood, uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone knows, but- uh, Tell the story, we got, yeah. We got the idea from the, from the AMTAP or the Argentinian School of Microelectronics from Telluride Workshop. That's what, actually the first school of microelectronics was two weeks long. We ended up so tired. <laughs> Since then on, it's just one week. <laughs> the first time we gave it a shot, it was two weeks because we were thinking of the three weeks of Telluride. Yeah, so this whole uh, Telluride workshop is very much like the AMTA school in the sense that there's lots of, of, um, of uh, you know, work on projects, there's learning about new technologies. And um, I'll just share also, I mean, so you have some idea about what the Telluride workshop is like. I share also the photo album of what it's like at the workshop so you can get some idea. Eventually we're gonna go physical again, or at least hybrid. Um, and perhaps some of you might, might come and participate just like Pedro and Pablo did. I remember when in those days when we did lots of microcontroller firmware hacking and you know, electronic measurements and prototyping. <laughs> now it's become a lot more deep learning stuff, but we still build things. It's fun. I call it like a summer holiday, right? Working holiday. Lots of poker playing and tennis playing and, you know, hiking in the mountains. Stuff like that. So anyway, hope you guys can make it some of you someday. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So... Thank Thanks. you so great much. To see you. It's 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 been as usual a great pleasure. Uh, it's one of these talks that it flies away because it's so interesting that it seems like it was 15 minutes. So thank you so much, Toby, for your time. Uh, let's pleasure. give him an applause. A virtual applause. Thank you for thank you for participation. Yeah. Hope to see you someday.
Thank you, Tony. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.